a look towards the infinite, off the beaten track in Egypt. Most of this country is a desert with many different facets. The people we'll be meeting have chosen to make their lives here in these vast spaces. Mansour is a child of the oasis. At Baharia, this young veterinarian cares for all the animals of the small farmers. He has become an important personality in the local community. Yuil was a civil engineer. He left his job as an architect to become a monk and joined one of the monasteries in the Wadi Natrun Valley that for 16 centuries now have been maintaining the traditions of Christianity and desert monks. Fenouille is a navigator of the sands. For more than 30 years, this Frenchman has been exploring these vast spaces. Traveling the desert with him means setting out to discover magnificent sites. I never get tired of these landscapes. It's a strange feeling like going back to the beginning of the world, like you're starting over. I've never met anyone who wasn't moved by the sight of these shifting dunes. Sahara. In the Arabic language, this word does not mean a region or a territory. It simply means desert. Just as the word ocean doesn't designate a specific body of water. From the banks of the Nile to the shores of the Atlantic, this one desert, under different names, stretches over a large part of northern Africa. It covers two-thirds of Egypt up to the Libyan border. Here it's called the Western Desert, formerly the Libyan Desert, and it's one of the driest deserts in the world. considered this desert an evil kingdom. Yet in the middle of this mineral ocean, a verdant archipelago resists the onslaught of the waves of sand. The five oases of the western desert are sheltered islands where the miracle of life has triumphed over the hostile climate. Living in an oasis means working the land. Here, farming, trade, and prayer set the rhythm of life. People leave for the fields every morning at the same time. They cultivate the land the same way their ancestors did. The path of life has already been traced for these men and women, and they follow it not out of resignation, but out of respect for tradition. Is she eating well? Yes. Is she eating normally? Yes. Is she pregnant? Yes. Three months. At Bawiti, in the Baharia oasis, everyone knows Dr. Mansour. He's from Baharia himself, and he's the only vet in town. For the farmers raising a few animals here, Mansour is a godsend. Everybody likes the vet here because they know I'm always ready to help them and their animals. Animals are their livelihood, and people worry as much about the health of their livestock as that of their children. After I finished my studies in Cairo, I tried to work there, but all I got were offers in pharmaceutical companies, and that didn't interest me. In the Oasis, everybody has livestock, so there's much more work here. Oddly enough, there are a lot more vets in the suburbs of Cairo than in the Oasis, but there's a real human dimension here and it's not too crowded. I'm the second vet who comes from the oasis. I'm a child of the oasis. Herodotus called them islands of the blessed. 
For more than 8,000 years, these oases have been inhabited, cultivated, preserved. Long isolated, the people of Siwa used to live in a town constructed of mud brick, nicknamed the City of Mud. A series of torrential rainstorms in the heart of the desert brutally transformed the past into a heap of ruins. In the space of four years, from 1926 to 1930, the city of Shali was totally devastated. As they had no other place to go, the people of the oasis built another city right next to it. And life goes on, more or less as always. Hello? والله المشكلة في يعني يا ندى وبكرة يا يوم السبت معلش هاي تعال بص يا دكتور بص الحالة مدي قد ايه؟ اي كل 20 يوم يو نيد تو جيف ام ا سيريز اوف انجكشنز يعني ياخذ مثلا ثلاث دوزات بعد 20 بعد 20 ثلاث دوزات يو نيد تو جيف ام 3 دوزات سبريد اوت اوفر سيفرال دايز اي كم باك از سون از اي كان تو اكزامن ذم اول Like I did for Sammy's camels. You really have to treat your sick animals every day for a month. Then you won't have to worry anymore. Hello, how are you? Fine. This is Sayed Sanusi. He's an agronomic engineer, and he's the best date palm specialist in the entire oasis. Okay, good luck. Maybe God created the desert so that man could appreciate the date trees, mused the author Paolo Coelho. There are 1,500,000 date palms in Bahariya. Dates are the leading product of the oasis. Here, everyone believes that the date palm benefits from special divine grace. And they all take very good care of this legendary tree. The date palm is like a human being. It's like a woman. Up until the age of about 45, she's fertile. Well, it's the same with the date palm. After 45, the female date palm no longer produces. And even if there is fertilization, the tree won't yield any fruit. All the oases in the western desert are situated in low basins of limestone plateaus between 100 and 130 meters below sea level. And in this geological configuration, the groundwater just gushes up. At first, this hot water that comes from deep within the earth flowed naturally. And then, as needs grew, other methods were needed to ensure the supply of water. An oasis is a natural environment structured by man with a whole system of technical and social management of the resources. In the Bahari Oasis, there are 86 machine dug wells and 243 natural wells. Until 1976, all the oases had only natural wells, but constant pumping caused water levels to drop, and from that time on, they started using machines to drill wells. It's not your garden variety dandelion that can go out and live in the Sahara, said Theodore Monod, a great connoisseur of the desert. And yet, in the oasis, the work of man has made some inroads into the desert. On the other hand, they've had to dig deeper and deeper to reach new water levels. Some investors are even trying to drill 1,200 meters into the subsoil. They dream of transforming these vast arid zones into fertile land, 
dreams that often last only a few seasons. The desert ground retains nothing. It has no memory. Whereas for millennia, the land has been intensively worked in the same way. And the organization of the water sharing remains an intangible rule of life. Tafoya has to irrigate regularly, twice a week in winter and every day in the heart of summer. It's painstaking work that no machine can do, and the tools they use haven't changed for centuries. Every plot of land is about three by three meters, and I have quite a few plots. I have about a hundred to irrigate on this side and about the same number on the other side of the road. Farming is a difficult job, but it's our profession, and it's been our family's profession for centuries. We never stop working every day. But every job has its drawbacks. I'm used to it. I've always done it. And when you do your job well, you can hope for a good result. As the proverb goes, every effort has its reward. Meanwhile, Dr. Mansour continues working on the farms. Be it for treatment or artificial insemination, he is always on call. There is, however, one domestic animal that he treats less and less, the donkey. For thousands of years, the donkey was the main means of transportation for man and goods in the oasis. But today, due to globalization, Chinese motorbikes have become serious competitors. Even in the heart of the desert, life is changing. In fits and starts, progress is coming to the oasis. But in these islands of the blessed, there is still a pleasant tranquility. For the people of the sand, working the earth is still the basis of their lives. They are strongly attached to the rhythm of work imposed by the sun, to the earth that must be watered, to life that must be protected. The desert surrounding us is vast and it protects us a little. There have been changes, but there are still a lot of people who preserve their customs and traditions. One day my father left for Cairo, and he couldn't stand the hustle and bustle. When he came back, he said something I liked a lot. He told me, if there's paradise on earth, it's the oasis. I couldn't live anywhere but in the oasis. And here, as the saying goes, I'm like a fish in water, and it's true. I couldn't live anywhere else. church bell sets a different tone. At four in the morning, the monks assemble for prayers. Two hours of psalms, chants, and litanies.
According to the Bible, the Holy Family took refuge here after the birth of Christ. So the Son of God spent the first years of his life on Egyptian soil. A few centuries later, the early Coptic Christians cite the Holy Family's flight into Egypt as proof that Christianity was born here. The fine points of doctrine aside, one thing is certain. Over time, thousands and thousands of monks have taken the vow to live here and consecrate their lives to meditation and prayer. Today, monastic life is attracting more and more candidates. And in light of their former lives, these men do not make the decision to enter the monastery lightly. Father Yuil is one of the Abbey's 120 monks. He's been here for 13 years, after leading a rather interesting secular life before. I was born in Mansoura. I grew up there and I studied there. I'm in a school of civil engineering. And after I got my engineering diploma, I worked for a few years in Argana and then Elbuana. I worked for several different architectural firms. And then, I decided to become a monk because I wanted to spend the rest of my life in God's presence. I wanted to live in a place like this. Here I'm completely happy. And I think it's the best decision I ever made in my life. One doesn't go to the desert to escape, even if the spirit can find refuge here. The Christians of the Orient settled here in order to pray in total peace. Islam didn't exist yet, and monks were already retiring from the world in search of an ascetic life. Over more than 16 centuries, their roots have taken hold here in the Sete Desert. At first they were hermits, and then they formed communities, now there are still four active Coptic monasteries in the valley of Wadi Natrun. For these desert monks, the isolation and living in caves like the early hermits belong to the distant past. Now they live in communities. Their cells are much more comfortable, but no outsider is allowed to enter them. They follow the rules of monastic life to the letter. Monastic life follows three rules, poverty, obedience, and chastity. Poverty allows detachment from everything. Chastity fosters purity of body and spirit. Obedience has to be followed all through life. You have to leave all your decisions in the hands of the abbot. Obedience is without question the most difficult of the rules. The daily life of the monks takes place behind these imposing walls. Walls meant to help in their spiritual quest, but also to protect them from the outside world. And yet their existence is not solely contemplative. Monasticism is based on two basic principles, prayer and work. Life in these monasteries is organized so as to be self-sufficient. There are 
120 monks in the convent of St. Pichoy, but there are at least 400 lay workers there as well. Some of them live here all year long, others for a few months at a time. We give him the work because if he gets the work here, he gets money for his family, to feed his family. And uh, he spent the good time in desert, uh, in monastic life, because we let uh, them pray, we let them uh, uh, confess, uh, we we let them share our life. Fields of cereal, olive groves, fruit trees, beans. The monks and their employees have managed to raise crops on the threshold of the desert. Self-sufficiency on a grand scale. A monastery operates like a business with a variety of activities. It's more than a community. It's a world in itself with its own codes and organization. There are no taxes, but there's no individual gain either. Everything is for the collective good. They've been in this spot for more than 16 centuries. Yet these monks have come a long way since the year 390 AD. They're not afraid of progress, and their skills acquired before they enter the monastery are put to good use on new development projects. The combination of techniques and ancestral skills has allowed them to earn a certain reputation. The influence of the Christians of Egypt means an economic influence too. And on this point, the monks are actively involved. Obviously, we make use of technology, cell phones and computers. A lot of monks use the internet. Almost all the monks have had higher education. Today we can master technology and not let it master us. And it's essential to understand the difference. Even if Coptic monks have not lived like hermits for a long time now, the desert still figures strongly in their religious vocation. They make regular retreats here alone for a few days or weeks to meditate and carry on this tradition. In the desert, the monk isolates himself and detaches himself from daily life. He lives only for God. Our spiritual fathers taught us that contemplation in the desert frees us from all material attachment so that we can deepen our spiritual relationship with God. Obviously, a person who can't adapt to the desert won't be able to bear the suspicion. But on the whole, the desert encourages personal growth. Here, we are at peace. The Wadi Natrun monks are a real success. When the monastery opens its doors to the public, it attracts an impressive crowd of faithful. The monks are seen as the cement of this religious community. Their continuous presence down through the centuries and their resistance to persecution are seen as a symbol of immortality. It's difficult to estimate the number of Copts. Seven million according to the Egyptian government, but religious authorities put the figure at 12 million. The figures are often a subject of controversy. But Egyptian Christians are attached to their particularities. And for them, coming to these monasteries is like making a pilgrimage. Undoubtedly, these Christian chants remain a sort of oriental blues, but the monks 
just don't run their hands in prayer, and they seem consistently cheerful. Amongst life is not one of competition, but of encouragement. There is no competition between us. There is a collective spirit where everyone can develop his own spiritual life. Our community is part of this world, a part protected by angels. Angelic life has no definition. It is a life where you feel at one with yourself. مش تعريف Quite simply. مش كلام يتقال Sometimes man is tolerated here on the condition that he's willing to show humility before the harsh elements. An unavoidable expanse on the caravan route, this western desert is a hostile place, and yet it exerts an attraction, a sort of magnetism. It is a refuge for mystics and the contemplative in search of the pure. This landscape is also the ideal setting for adventurers in quest of boundless horizons. fondness for the Western Desert. For more than 30 years, he has been crisscrossing the desert in a variety of ways. At first, he organized and ran rallies. Then his competitive spirit waned, but he still has a real fascination for these landscapes. For the ancient Egyptians, the great sea of sand began immediately after the last oasis. This marked the end of the kingdom of the living and the beginning of the kingdom of the dead. And between them, there was a dangerous no man's land called chaos, where you could find yourself trapped. And they were right to be wary, because in certain directions, it was uncrossable. The desert is both life and death. It reminds us of the fragility and the beauty of our humanity. Heading out into the desert is always an adventure. You can't forget anything. Gas, water, food, tools. But above all, you mustn't set out in just one vehicle. A breakdown in the middle of the desert can quickly turn into a serious problem. This is a well-known Saharan ritual that gives the tire the same consistency as a camel's hoof. We deflate the tire. It gets wider and there's more surface in contact with the ground. We deflate it to 800 grams of pressure. The desert is a sort of solid ocean, and there are many similarities between the sea and the desert. The chain of dunes is like a series of rollers on the sea, and rather than driving, you feel more like you are navigating as you set a course to make your way across this sea of sand. You have to consider the dune as something fluid, something that shifts, that moves, and that's why they give you a feeling of eternity. You see a frozen storm. Here we're on Gur Abu Muharraq, the father of impassable dunes. Abu means father, but I prefer to say mother. It's prettier. It represents the mother, maternity, and mother ocean, because it's vast like an ocean. So I'm bending the rules, but why not? 
ça représente 550 km. Donc c'est le, la plus longue so chaîne de dunes euh, d'Égypte, euh, euh, du Sahara et probablement du monde. Et je ne m'en lasse pas. I never get tired of it. À pied, en chameau, I like discovering à moto, it on foot, by camel, motorcycle, or car. Different pleasures, but equally profound. Being in the desert means choosing your route, euh, studying the difficulties, et and trying to evaluate them correctly. Et de bien les Hundreds of kilometers to the south, a passage leads you through the waves of dunes to an amazing sight. When you cross the western desert with Fenouille, you discover areas that are as grandiose as they are mysterious. And we come upon a phenomenon that no one could have imagined finding here. limestone cave in the Sahara. Uh, Osa, you can see enormous stalactites. Uh, the corresponding stalagmites have been buried under the sand for thousands of years. And this proves that the Sahara was green. Was green. Was green. Was green. Was green. Cette grotte était un point de passage obligé des caravanes pour deux raisons, parce qu'il y avait de, de, de l'eau dedans, donc c'était important, et parce que c'est à 15 km d'un endroit où il y a un passage entre les dunes que peuvent emprunter euh, les chameaux. Un explorateur allemand euh, l'a redécouvert, on dit, en 1873, mais comme ça ne l'intéressait pas qu'il essayait de faire toute autre chose, euh, il n'a pas noté le point géographique. Et, Much later, in 1991, another German rediscovered the cave. Qui perdu, but now, the water's gone. Mais maintenant, il y a plus d'eau. Traveling the desert means confronting the unknown, looking for landmarks in the middle of emptiness, and knowing that the slightest undulation in the sand could turn out to be a trap. It calls for a great deal of knowledge to be able to negotiate the desert safely. One miscalculation, and the car stops short. In the second vehicle, Karim, the second driver, Rushdie, the mechanic, and Saeed, the cook, are bogged down. Three times, five times a day, they have to help each other out of these sand traps. Karim, Karim, tell us when you're okay. Okay, on y va. Okay, let's go. Karim est étudiant en sable, Karim son métier qui rentre. Sand. Euh, c'est un mec super. He's a great guy. Euh, He's toujours cool. cool. On va arrêter pour les Ok, enough compliments. <rire> Dès qu'il s'agit de sable et de dunes, il faut être dunes, deux véhicules you need parce que euh, because anyone n'importe can get qui into peut se mettre you can fool around when you're done, difficile. but not you before. Le après, mais pas, you never know what might avant, happen. Parce pas ce qui va avant. Fenui was certainly not predestined to become a desert specialist. He had a degree in philosophy and became a journalist. While working on a story in Algeria, he discovered the elegance and freedom of the shifting dunes. That was almost 40 years ago, and from that moment on, his love for the desert grew stronger and stronger. Là, on a l'impression d'être à la naissance du monde. Here you feel like you're at the beginning of the world. 
il y a un côté magique. Il y a un côté magique à tous ces rochers et du sable doux. Si il n'y avait pas de sable, on se tapait sur les rocks, cailloux. Here, et là, on, on glisse, on surfe sur le sable entre des, des rochers de plus en plus serrés et qui nous font un peu dériver de notre cap, mais, mais ils sont si beaux qu'on ne peut pas leur en vouloir. Quand on est près des rochers, il y a le vent qui travaille différemment la dune qui la creuse. Et comme dans l'océan, il faut faire attention quand on passe près des parce que près des récifs, il y a des tourbillons de la mer. Et là, il peut y avoir des tourbillons de dunes. Normalement, c'est toujours un peu creusé et un peu dangereux. Quand j'ai découvert cet endroit, ça fait un peu prétentieux de dire découvert. Simplement, il n'y avait pas de raison logique de passer par là. Simplement, il n'y avait pas de raison logique de passer par là. Et quand on voit un endroit du désert où il n'y a aucun cairn, ça veut dire aucun tas de pierres, c'est personne n'est passé. Et moi, j'y suis passé pour le plaisir. Et quand j'y suis passé, j'ai appelé ça la baie d'Alon du désert. J'ai jamais été dans la baie d'Alon. Ceux qui ont été pour peut-être se moquer de moi, mais on voit plein de rochers. Ces rochers perturbent le travail du vent sur les dunes. Les dunes se disloquent, mais continuent à passer. Et là, on voit que le sable est un fluide parce qu'il passe entre des îlots, comme dans la baie d'Alon, l'océan circule entre les rochers. Là, le sable continue sa course. Et ça, c'est un paysage unique au monde. As soon as night falls, so does the temperature, and it's brutal. You have to set up camp well before sunset, make a fire, and let Saeed get to work with the gas burner. Avec des amis, on s'interrogeait sur le déclic. We talk on se disait, come here. il faut qu'on ait quelque part un grain, c'est-à-dire qu'autrefois, quelqu'un pouvait aimer le désert et pratiquer le désert par obligation, je parle des caravanes de, qui traversaient le, le désert, et si on veut abandonner la civilisation, le confort, une recherche de danger, de frissons, mais aussi d'amour de, as well as de la nature, nature il euh, n'y a rien de rationnel, c'est une passion. A passion. Exactement comme, euh, like comme l'océan et comme la montagne, on fait souvent cette euh, comparaison. C'est-à-dire qu'on accepte, accepte de galérer, de chercher, et peu importe le moyen de locomotion, le grand désert, c'est toujours difficile à un moment ou à un autre. Le désert libyque, c'est celui qui me plaît le plus parce que c'est le plus sauvage, c'est la plus vaste étendue de sable. Il y a des légendes, mais aussi il y a des histoires d'aventuriers, de, d'explorateurs. Euh, et puis, c'est le désert le plus varié que je connais. Sur des courtes distances, ça varie très vite dans le désert libyque égyptien. Sometimes the wind and the sand give birth to strangely formed knolls, to dunes with perfect curves, or to beds of rocks sculpted like blades. You need a vast amount of knowledge of the desert, a dose of recklessness, and that famous touch of madness to brave such wild terrain. Even though there's no proper marker, this is the only way through. This gully has a drop of more than 120 meters. Karim, I think you can shift down to third gear and then to second at the bottom. Il 
piège typique, on voit une dune. Here you have a typical trap. When you see a dune with a very steep slope, you have to watch out not to crash into the rocks. On a tous fait des bêtises dans le désert. Euh, moi, le premier, puisque je suis venu sans rien y, sans rien y comprendre. Si j'ai survécu, c'est que j'ai appris petit à petit. Mais par exemple, quand on traverse des dunes, il faut toujours être humble. Il faut être prudent, il faut comprendre, il faut réfléchir et il faut apprécier. de belles phrases sur le désert parce que ça inspire le désert mais il y en a une que j'aime beaucoup c'est une nouvelle peu connue de Honoré de Balzac c'est un soldat de Napoléon un vieux soldat qui raconte sa campagne d'Égypte à ses petits-enfants et il l'interrompt tout le temps mais comment c'était le désert mais comment c'était le désert et il cherche ses mots et à la fin il dit ça y est j'ai trouvé le désert c'est Dieu avant les hommes. Et il n'y a pas besoin de, de, de croire pour avoir goût de la transcendance, effectivement. Euh, quand on voit le désert, on voit une terre vierge. Avant que l'homme ait fait quoi que ce soit, en bien ou en mal, il n'était pas là. After five days of pure desert, this sign of life looms up like a mirage. This remote forgotten citadel is the vestige of a time when life really existed in this place that's so lifeless today. What happened? Why did men construct this fortress? And why here, in the middle of nowhere? C'est la plus grande forteresse de la colonisation romaine qui a été bâtie il y a à peu près 2000 ans. Les Romains ont occupé l'Égypte pendant à peu près 400 ans et cette forteresse servait à protéger les caravanes. Il y avait d'importantes garnisons romaines. L'endroit s'appelle Doum el Dabaïd, la source scorpion. Elle a été abandonnée il y a 500 ans parce que les sources se sont taries. Mais l'eau a ressurgi à Harga, qui est la plus grande oasis d'Égypte actuellement. Et ce lieu s'est retrouvé abandonné au désert, comme souvent. C'est aussi le dernier endroit connu où serait passée l'armée de Candice. On met toujours un conditionnel, mais apparemment, les scientifiques sont d'accord, c'est le dernier endroit où on a la trace de cette armée. In 525 BC, Cambyses, the powerful king of Persia, after conquering most of Egypt, sent his army to the oasis of Siwa to subjugate the oracle of Amun. But then, a unique occurrence in history. That army of 50,000 men vanished. Longtemps, on a cru que c'était une légende. Maintenant, les historiens le savent. Euh, L'armée de Cambyse était réellement composée de 50 000 hommes. C'était donc un record du monde à l'époque. Hérodote raconte que cette armée 
a disparu dans une terrible tempête de sable qu'il a enseveli. L'idée est intéressante, cinématographique, elle a été reprise dans le patient anglais qui est un film merveilleux, mais c'est impossible avec les informations qu'avait le détective Hérodote à l'époque qui ne pouvait pas s'en tirer. Ce qui est beaucoup plus probable, c'est que cette armée a fait une erreur de navigation et cette armée a dû s'égarer et elle est morte de soif puisqu'elle n'est jamais revenue ni arrivée. Et comme on n'en voit pas les traces pour le moment, elle doit être sous une des énormes d'une cathédrale de la grande mer de sable. For more than a century, historians have been looking for traces of that army. And in November 2009, Italian archaeologists discovered vestiges of what might be part of Cambyses famous army. 2500 years later, the enigma of that disappearance might be solved. People have become interested in the desert fairly recently. As long as only caravans crossed it, nobody, or almost nobody, ventured off the camel routes. It was not until the beginning of the 20th century that the first explorers began to venture in, thanks to the automobile. And those scientific expeditions were hunting for the lost oasis, called Zerzura. That paradise on Earth contained a city sheltered in the heart of steep cliffs. And the myth of the lost oasis still preserves all its mystery. On se trouve ici sur une We're des on one of history's first roads for cars, built between 1925 and 1930 by the English and their Hindu workers, because the Egyptians didn't want to go out into the desert to break rocks. It was quickly abandoned because it was covered by sand. With a new road circling the oasis, this one's been forgotten. When it was reopened in 1986, no one had been on it for more than 30 years. And you felt like you were traveling towards a magical land, a lost oasis, where there were traces of civilization, cairns, but no cars. Everything had been erased by the wind. C'est une très belle barcade. C'est une dune qui a trois caractéristiques. C'est la dune la plus rapide du monde, celle qui avance. Elle a une forme de croissant et ce sont les têtes qui avancent. Une barcade peut se déplacer de... De 5 on the average, à 12 a bar can can move 5 to 12 meters a year. Et en moyenne, That's 75 ça fait meters a century. 75 mètres en un siècle régulièrement. Et What's more, euh, en plus, it can elle give peut birth enfanter, c'est-à-dire qu'au bout de la tête se forme un petit tas de sable qui devient un autre grows. croissant et qui grandit. This apparently hostile land seems to breathe, as if the Sahara were a place that gives life to the mineral world. After days of traveling, after making a big loop from east to west in a multiform desert, Fenui finally arrives at what he considers the most beautiful sight of all, the Great Sea of Sand. All of a sudden, infinity is within reach. Je me lasse pas de ces paysages et c'est un sentiment curieux de passer de la fin du monde à l'origine du monde, à la fois que tout va commencer. Et j'ai jamais vu quelqu'un qui soit blasé devant le mouvement des dunes. Chacun est libre d'aller chercher ce qu'il veut dans le désert. Moi, je ne viens pas chercher la solitude, je suis très attaché à ma famille et à mes amis. Mais j'apprécie quand je vais dans le désert un changement I enjoy this total complet. contrast. When I'm in the civilized le matin, world, I get the morning the journal, the soir, I get the journal, the papers, and devour all the news. Et quand je pars dans le désert pendant When un I mois, go back to the desert, de nouvelles. I do without the news for et a month. I come back and ask, which old fools died? But I'm not being heartless. It's not méchant. Il y a 
It's just that I get the feeling that the world hasn't changed much. There's always just as much misery. Just as much happiness. There's always just as much happiness. There's always just as much happiness. Just as much happiness. There's always 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 just as much